So we have, and we are recording this. I hope that's okay for everyone. Um, so we have some great speakers and I'm going to first now invite Amber from the Decolonizing Wealth Project. Just a few minutes, Amber, tell us um, wh what, does, what does the Decolonizing Wealth Project do and how does it intersect with this effort to decolonize the sector? Thank you, Dylan. Hello, everyone. Great to be here with you all today. My name is Amber Banks with Decolonizing Wealth Project. Um, Decolonizing Wealth Project is an organization based in the United States uh, that does work here in the States and globally um, focused on decolonizing philanthropy. So we envision a world where racial equity has become a societal norm and we have new systems and ways of being that ensure that everyone can live their best lives, thrive in their cultures and bring about healing from generations of colonial trauma. We do this work through um, a few different strands. We have uh, our philanthropic advocacy and practice work where we support funders specifically around the world to decolonize their practices and redistribute wealth. Uh, we have focused work on racial healing because we know that healing has to be part of this work. And then we work in the area of narrative change and culture where we really lean into storytelling traditions and bring visibility to the stories that will shift the narratives around decolonizing wealth. So in our work uh, globally, we acknowledge that uh, global philanthropy itself is uh, founded on and perpetuates um, exploitation, uh, division and control. And um, this happens through really generating and has historically happened through um, exploiting uh, black and brown bodies for profit and then dictating the conditions under which the, you know, a real fraction of that money is given via philanthropy. So we see now today that 95% of foundations are concentrated in either Europe or North America, dictating the conditions under which resources can flow um, to the global South and beyond. So we really work to, uh, to, to question and to advocate and to push philanthropy and aid to challenge racist assumptions that uh, actors around the world are not uh, bringing the wisdom agency and expertise needed to control these resources and redistribute wealth on a larger scale. Um, and so, uh, we focus on a few different strands in terms of how we decolonize these resource flows. Number one is the recognition and acknowledgement of the historical and structural roots of racism and inequity in global philanthropy. So we think that truth telling is a really important aspect of all of this to really name how we got here and what the origins of wealth are around the world and how we uh, stop the perpetuation of these harm and injustices by naming their historical roots. Second, um, building new decision-making tables. So rather than kind of pulling up new chairs, really setting new tables where we're giving back decision-making power to uh, those who've been marginalized from it and really leaning into unlearning harmful practices that have perpetuated these inequities and building new relationships built on trust and uh, honoring the expertise and agency of, of those who are at these new decision-making tables, really, really prioritizing the expertise of Global South actors. And then finally is the redistribution of wealth. And so we believe that those who are closest to the problems that we seek to solve have the best solution. And in order to repair the generations of harm that have been caused, we have to completely reinvest resources and redistribute that wealth in, uh, in ways that allow for self-determination and agency. So with that, I will pass it to Dylan. Who am I passing to? Thanks, Amber. That's really um, that's really really helpful. And we're now going to hand over to one of our other wonderful guests here. We have Meska here from Indonesia for Humanity, 
We've just heard from Amber about um, what this means in terms of uh, private philanthropy and the problems that are inherent in the way philanthropy works. And I think we'll we'll hear more about that from the Decolonizing Wealth Project later. Um, Meska, from your perspective and the work that Indonesia for Humanity has been doing, tell us about that work and how it intersects with decolonizing. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Meska. I'm from Indonesia Untuk Kemanusiaan. In English, it's Indonesia for Humanity, also known as um, ICA. So, uh, and thank you for having me. So I would like to share briefly about ICA and what we do. So ICA's history dates back to 1995, which is a, a pivotal period during the final years of Indonesia's authoritarian regime. And this era witnessed the emergence of the pro-democracy movement. And when ICA was founded, it was with the purpose to support uh, the pro-dem movement through small and micro grants. And fast forward to today, we proudly identify ourselves as a civil society resource organization or a CSRO. Our primary mission is to empower civil society, fostering um, a vision of a just, dignified and prosperous life for all. Um, this vision is intricately woven into the fabric of human rights and environmental sustainability. Our programs focus on issues such as gender equity, human rights, diversity, tolerance, cl and climate justice, all implemented through collaborative efforts with civil society organizations. Um, ICA bears the characteristics of being small, flexible, inclusive, and bold. Being small provides a unique opportunity for us to support new ideas emerging from the grassroots. Another of our characteristics um, lays in our small size support, yet responsive and flexible. So we are not designed to be a bureaucratic institution, but we want to be an institution that is able to merge ourselves and collaborate with all parties. We are open to various groups fighting for humanity and building self-sufficiency. We make every effort to free ourselves from dependence on certain parties who can influence our goals and work models. This is not an easy process, but we still make self-sufficiency a principle in fighting for humanity. And um, the uniqueness of ICA as a CSRO is reflected in our work model, which um, champion a collaborative ecosystem, solidarity economy, and a new constituency to change the culture of sharing. One of its manifestations can be seen in how we define resources. We believe that resources go beyond mere financial support. We operate under the guiding framework of Chatur Daya, in English, it's the four dimensions of resources. We recognize resources as funds, knowledge, voluntarism, and networks as the pillars of true transformation. This framework um, reshapes our understanding of resources, embracing a holistic spectrum that goes beyond conventional um, donor-centric models. It's a testament to our commitment to acknowledging and harnessing the inherent wealth within communities and organizations. Um, the, the principle of collaboration and equality can be seen through what we call as the community of enablers. It is a collaborative ecosystem consisting of individuals, groups, or organizations who work together actively and sustainably in raising, distributing, and managing, as well as generate meanings of public resources to support humanitarian and environmental conservation work. The community of um, enablers is depicted in an interconnected circle. So this circle depicts that no one is in a higher or lower position in this ecosystem. Everyone plays an important role. Um, we like to see that ECAL is like a small fish in a big pond trying to make a big difference. So we tend to wonder how does this small fish can give meaning to our role and the micro initiatives that we support in the context of the big and long work of social transformation. And we also note that I believe this is also a, a common concern that there is a crisis at the heart of how we measure social transformation. There is a mismatch between what happens on the ground in civil society development and what the donors want. So, and ICA has been on the receiving end of both. 
<laughs> Thus, uh, we do not want to replicate the approach of conventional monitoring and evaluation. So we came up with pemaknaan. Uh, pemaknaan, we, we, we do not have the fixed term for it in English, but pemaknaan is that we do not measure. The goal is not to measure or calculate how many workshops have been implemented by an organization, how many people attended the workshop, but we want to measure the organization's ability to transform, the, the power of transformation that the organization has. Uh, so pemaknaan, it aims to build an understanding of social transformation efforts and to contribute to the sustainability of social movements through shared learning and knowledge in social movement environment regarding the ups and downs, the struggles at the grassroots while trying to identify future challenge. And this is also the uh, a chance for the person doing pemaknaan to celebrate their subjectivity. So this is like an antidote to the conventional monitoring and evaluation that glorifies subjectivity. So in essence, ICA's journey is one of evolution from its root in supporting democracy to becoming a force for a comprehensive transformation, embracing the diverse dimensions that contribute to a resilient and thriving civil society. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Meska, and so interesting to hear um, what you say about your approach to um, measuring what matters, right? So really trying to shift uh, donor perceptions and I guess your own community's perceptions about what transformation really looks like. Um, and that reminds me again of, of the, uh, the, the earlier sort of framing that we had about uh, decolonizing around reclaiming power, agency and dignity you know, really understanding that that's where, where that actually sits in the ecosystem. And you talked about yourself being uh, a small fish in a big pond. Maybe we're all smish, small fish in, in, in a big pond, but yeah. I think that um, together we can make a big difference. And it's really interesting to hear how you are trying to, to really ensure that you have the agency and your communities that you work with have the agency rather than um, that power sitting somewhere else, particularly with the donors. Um, I'd love to uh, invite Ambika now to join. So Ambika is from the Nilan Tiruchalgam Trust in Sri Lanka. Um, Ambika, tell us about your work and, and what decolonizing means for you and your organization. Um, thank you, Dylan. As uh, was said earlier, we are also a small fish in a, a big pond. Uh, uh, and... Uh, I will maybe go back to, I see this, your question, your first question is about how our work intersects with efforts to decolonize international aid, philanthropy. I think this has, uh, I see it as having two parts. One is, of course, decolonizing international aid, which is about the transfer of mainly financial resources and often from the global north to the global south. But there's also decolonizing grant making, which is the process by which the funds are dispersed or shared. Now, this is applicable not only to the national, international or the national bilateral, multilateral relationship, but also the systems and processes within grant making organizations, even indigenous ones like Nilanthiru Chalvam Trust or ICA. Both these systems and processes are built on historical inequality, inequity, discrimination, violence, poverty, need. Now, Amber mentioned truth-telling about the origins of wealth. So I'm going to go a step beyond that. I say that the crux of aid and grant making is that it is those who have the resources, provide resources and assistance to those without. Hence, the very foundation of the aid system, of grant making itself, is built on power disparity. And this power disparity is reproduced throughout every layer. International aid and grant making as I see it, therefore tackles only the symptoms, not the root causes of discrimination, violence, power, or even human rights violations. Why? Because it's easier to tackle the symptoms and because tackling the root causes also requires you to confront the fundamentals of these very systems, these ecosystems that all of us 
inhabit and the processes that we use. This requires holding a mirror to oneself. It means changing the status quo, which is also disruptive. And why would those holding power want to disrupt their ecosystem or want to dismantle their privilege or move out of their comfort zone? What is it in for them? And how do, or should I say, how can this be in, uh, incentivized? And is it even possible to incentivize this? I think these are some of the questions that uh, we need to also discuss further at Bogota. In this context, um, the very existence of the Neil and Thiruchelvam Trust, a local grant making organization is itself a part of decolonizing aid and decolonizing grant making. Yet we are well aware that we, we can very easily become part of the problem. Why? Because we are local, we know the communities, we have access and knowledge that the international donors may not have. We may have influence that we, they may not have. These are all positive aspects. And often we look at this as positive aspects that local grant makers have that we say uh, will enable greater localization. But this also gives us more power and we can easily abuse this power. And in order to be accepted into the global grant makers club, like the boys club, or the, you know, the global or the big, you know, the grant makers club, even in Sri Lanka of the big wigs, we may feel the need to adhere to processes that are inequitable and reproduce the dysfunctionality for which we critique international donors. Mimicking international donors leads to what I call, and this came up with in a conversation that Jenny and I had just yesterday, what I call trickle down inequality in the guise of achieving social justice. Hence, what this requires is decolonizing the mindset, even our mindsets, because especially in our region, South Asia, the culture is still rather feudal. And this seeps into aspects of public life, public institutions, civil society, and even grant making. Uh, and this is a region where the elite still sing the praises of colonialism. So what we must do is to refuse to accept that the way things are done now is the only way. We must question existing policies, systems, and processes, and we have to take risks. Uh, and most importantly, we must be mindful of from whom we receive funds and under what conditions. To effect change, I think that, you know, you have to seed power, not seize it. This requires us and at NTT, we are very aware that we need to check our privilege. We need to constantly interrogate and review our institutional systems and processes, our monitoring and evaluation, our grant making assessment, how we conduct due diligence, everything, both macro and micro, and be willing to change, be flexible. Because as was said earlier, uh, the rules and systems we have are for to enable our work and to benefit the communities. And when it doesn't, we need to change them. This sounds simple, but as we have learned from experience, it's the most difficult thing to do. So finally, how do we measure our success? So how should we measure our success? I think for us, those of us doing this kind of work, success is working ourselves out of a job. It is working towards a world, sounds very idealistic, but working towards a world where this sector of philanthropy is not needed. Thank you. Ambika, thank you so much for that. That was fascinating to hear. And I just wanted to um, to repeat a couple of the, the gems I heard there. You talked about um, the boys club and how we somehow reproduce uh, inequality. You talked about trickle down inequality. It's interesting you say that because when we've spoken to activists around the world, one of the things we talk about in terms of decolonizing mindsets is actually that they have to decolonize their own mindsets. Um, I think, you know, our American friends would say that we've all drunk the Kool-Aid. We've all had this sense of a system that seems to function, although actually now we're beginning to understand how dysfunctional it is, that actually we have internalized some of those structural racism, uh, the structural racism and also the neo-colonial attitudes, whether we are um, uh, global north actors trying to do good or we are from the global south and we are it, whether it's a grant making foundation or whether it's a local organization 
we may have also um, inherited and embodied some of those problematic attitudes. So actually, this the process of decolonizing seems to me, from what I hear from you as well, is it's this is not just about Global North actors changing their attitudes and practices, but it's all of us. All of us thinking about how we may have benefited from the existing system, and even if we don't feel like we've benefited from the existing system, how we might um, challenge ourselves in terms of how we want to do things differently. Um, so I really liked what you said about changing the rules. We do need to change our own rules, the rules of the system, but our own rules that we that have governed us. Um, and as you say, success might actually mean that the, the radical proposition of doing ourselves out of the job as well. Um, so lots to do there and lots of big challenges, but I'm really, really glad that you sort of pinpointed how um, uh, you and your team are doing um, in Sri Lanka uh, to, on that, on that uh, journey. And finally, we now have our uh, colleague Madonna from Sibsource Uganda. So Madonna, if you're there um, and you can hear us okay, it'd be great to hear about your work, the work of your organization and what your, um, how that intersects with decolonizing. Thank you, Dylan, and for the opportunity to just share our experiences here. My name is Madonna and I lead the philanthropy program at Sibsource Africa. Sibsource is a Pan-African philanthropy support organization and our broader vision is philanthropy that works and civil society that thrives. We happen to operate in three positions as a donor advisor, as a grant maker, and we have an implementing arm that enables our philanthropy support work, uh, which includes the philanthropy program where I fall. And by virtue of this positioning, we were able to see the inequality the inequities that exist within our development sector. And it's one of the things that may have led us to host conversations on decolonizing aid in Uganda. And for us, the decolonization process has been one through which we understand the manifestations of coloniality and explore ways to counter them. And our approach to countering has been through a reimaginative process because the conversations tended to be all gloom and doom uh, for the most part, especially the part where we sort of prompt introspection and truth sharing on the part of NGOs, INGOs about the experiences of the current aid system. And when it came to the reimaginative element of it, it has involved us tackling the colonial attitudes that we didn't even know we had. So both at at a personal level, but also at an organizational level. So it's about rethinking things like trust, dignity, uh, attitudes around fundraising and the like, and also how they translate into the systems of development in which we currently operate. So by virtue of these conversations, we, by virtue of our positioning as um, an advisor, a grant maker, an implementer, we were able, we had the advantage of our quality shape shifting to get some people in the room that would not have typically um, convened if we only existed as an NGO. So that's probably something to note about the context and how we've been able to have these conversations in Uganda. Um, that's pretty much it about CIVSOS. Thank you. Madonna, tell me, um, you talked about introspection and truth-telling and, and about tackling those sort of colonial attitudes. How how have you embarked on that? I mean, we, we've I think we've already heard that we need to do it, all of us, both Global South and Global North actors alike. Um, how have you done that in your work at CIVSOURCE? So we've had a series of conversations. Some of them have been internal, but others have included um, convening local NGOs separately as well as convening them alongside um, INGOs. So having funders in the room and nonprofits within the same space. And we had a series of questions that would ask, more like conversation prompts, to foster the truth sharing and, ex and to foster the sharing of experiences about how these NGOs have experienced aid within our particular sector. And through, after they've shared the experiences, we went on to not just you know, end at just what those experiences have been because they were not necessarily um, the most pleasant of experiences, but we went on to reimagine what does the future look like? What does a different sector or system look like? And this was in the reimagination section of it. 
and they've shared a couple of things that they've tried to do um, within, you know, the different um, sectors, if I should put it that way. So for the grassroots organizations, it's them deciding to form maybe coalitions that defy or decide not to take particular grants from funders that don't necessarily extend dignity to them. Uh, those are some of the few steps or expressions of pushback that we've seen springing up from these conversations. For others, it's forming coalitions that, you know, state and and state the fact that they understand the context better and to maybe level the competitive approaches to fundraising, such that if a funder is coming in, they know that they're not necessarily going to leave a community torn apart by the competition that typically comes with uh, the, the proposals and the limited funding that requires one organization sort of battle it out with another organization to access that kind of funding. So we're seeing coalitions growing and just different kinds of pushback in our context. Thanks, Madonna. That's really uh, interesting to hear. And I think um, I, before we move into the next uh, session or, or section of this conversation, I, I'd like to invite um, any of the speakers to really reflect on what they've heard from, from their fellow speakers here. We've heard from Madonna that I think the need to push back uh, from to donors, not to accept uh, the status quo and the, the, the imbalances in the system. Um, we've heard about the importance of storytelling, I think, uh, a number of times from Amber and others, um, and, and, and the, the, the trickle-down inequality that Ambika talked about and how we really need to challenge that. And I think from, from Maiska, particularly, I heard that sort of sense of really reclaiming agency and, and determining what you feel is, is progress and, and how to transform um, your communities and, and your organization. But I'd, I'd just invite any of you, um, the speakers so far, to reflect on what you've heard and where you think, you know, what commonalities are you hearing from across those um, uh, different contexts um, that we might be able to pull out and, and then think about when we're designing the program in, in Bogota. Ambika. This is more of a, a question than a comment and a difficult question. Uh, in the sense of the question I, I asked earlier about how do we incentivize uh, particularly the boys club or the big wigs or the big donors to even be part of the conversation? Because if you want change, they need to first be part of the conversation. Now, our, our recent experience uh, is that it's difficult to even do that. Uh, in some places, extremely difficult, because uh, I think there is, as I said, this uh, fear or concern about uh, others trying to dismantle the system and the er erosion of the status quo. So how do we do that? Because if we can't get them to even be part of the conversation, how are we going to the next step and the more difficult steps that are that we need to uh, you know, go through? Thanks, Ambika. Well, maybe I'll in invite Amber. Amber, you're from the Decolonizing Wealth Project. You have seen exactly this resistance. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, you and your team and, and um, Edgar um, have been, I think, done, doing an incredible job of trying to engage with private philanthropic organizations, predominantly in the US, but now more internationally. That boys club, as Ambika talked about, to engage them. How how have you done it and what resistance have you experienced and what tactics might you share with us to try and bring bring people on board? It's a great question, Ambika. Thank you for bringing that forward. I think, you know, it's a it's a present challenge and one that we are seeing some traction. So um, I think about um, examples like in the UK with Len Kelly Faith. Um, who have committed uh, their endowment towards, uh, you know, redistributing their wealth to um, to global South actors, to to folks who have been traditionally disenfranchised, and you know, there's several examples of others in the United States who've done so, and it really comes about through relationships. And through you know sitting down and having conversations and really dismant dismantling through honest conversations about the origins of wealth and really unpacking where this money has come from and on whose backs 
it has been built. And having conversations about the mechanics of actually, uh, you know, redistributing that wealth and showing that it's actually possible, right? That there are these barriers that we um, envision are in place, these rules that have been put into place and practices that they can change. Um, I would love to invite Carlos. Carlos, um, are you are you on the line? Yeah. Hey, Amber. Hi there. Um, it's very early over here in the United States. Um, Carlos, I'm curious um, <clears throat> what you would add to this. Absolutely. Uh, good morning and uh, good day to everyone. This is Carlos here. I work with Amber and Edgar at the Decolonizing Wealth Project. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's this is the the biggest challenge here. I think is what we're seeing is <clears throat> you know everyone here on this call we we get it to some extent and uh, are really struggling to figure out how to get some of the folks with big big purse strings uh, right big money bags to the table to actually redistribute. And I think we have sometimes taken an unorthodox approach here <clears throat> that I want to share with you all. Uh, you know, a large part of our work does center or center around decentering the donor, right? So this idea that in many of our cultures and our systems, uh, we still deify and glorify donors as the saviors, and you know, we're saying we're not we're not doing any of that. So, at Decolonizing Wealth Project, for example, uh, we have a donor vehicle community of over six hundred and twenty five donors both institutional and individual, and none of them have decision-making power. So we've said to them, you give us the resources and community gets to decide where those resources go. And what we've really walked donors through is understanding that this is about their personal liberation as much as it is about the liberation and the decolonization of resources. Um, and for us, uh, when we say liberated capital, we don't just mean liberate the capital itself um, for the recipients and for grassroots community work. We're also talking about liberating uh, capital holders from the need to control and the need to dominate um, and the need to exploit through their resources. And so we actually invite donors through a healing journey of their own. Um, and we have found that that's really critical, actually, that as we're talking about inviting donors to this difficult conversation, that it's not just about being yelled at or, or being told everything they're doing wrong. It's actually also about their personal liberation from the oppressive um, ways of being um, that a lot of donors and institutions with wealth um, have been operating under. And we find that when we make that call, that invitation um, to go on a personal healing journey while decolonizing their wealth, they get it a lot more. They really start to understand the essence of what we're talking about. So <clears throat> it's difficult because you can't do that with everyone. Sometimes you got to fight. Sometimes you got to say the hard thing. But wherever you can find an opportunity to invite donors um, into a healing journey of their own, and if you can paint a clear picture of how decolonizing wealth um, is actually good for all of us in the long run, I think that's where we've seen a lot of traction with donors. Carlos, thank you so much. I, I'm aware of time and I will come to you, Ambika, but I think what you have said, you and Amber have said is, is really powerful because you're first reminding us that this is about, this is relational. You know, yes, there might be some naming and shaming and, so, and there might need to be some, you know, very stark truth telling. But this is also about relationships um, and their own personal transformation. And I think from at least Peace Direct's perspective, you know, we've been speaking to bilateral donors, um, INGOs and, and private philanthropic organizations. These are all people who I, they think they're doing a good job. They want to help. They believe that they're there to help. And actually for them to hear that actually they might have been doing harm in the process of, being, of doing good, I think has been quite a revelation for them. And I think that that conversation, that's how we can open up that conversation because we, I think we have to believe that the, those in the system, the, the vast majority of them are trying to do the right thing, but they've made some terrible mistakes along the way and they continue to make some mistakes and they continue to hold some really problematic attitudes. But building that relationship and explaining to them 
how they how how the system isn't working for local actors and civil society organizations around the world is part of that truth telling and part of that journey um and certainly we've seen people change people change within organizations and those organizations change so to answer ambika's question how do we do it it is it is difficult but we are seeing you know that engagement and i think carlos you you, you spoke about that so eloquently Ambika, you have your hand up and then we'll we'll go on to the next session um, but uh, shortly, but just to give you the last word. Yeah, very quickly, I was um, as I was listening to Amber and Carlos, uh, what they because I worked with bilaterals, large bilaterals, uh, as well as private foundations. And the difference is that with private foundations, what you said, yes, it is relational. And we've been able to build that relationship, change mindsets, make them aware that is possible also because their wealth or capital is in their hands. And it is not swayed generally, usually by politics or geopolitics. But where bilaterals are concerned, it's irrelevant. And I think what's going on in the world shows us that. What's happening today shows us that. So for us, because they get their instructions from capitals and it depends on you know how much money they get also depends on uh, what they want to do with their presence in the particular country, which other country in the region they see as a threat and what they want to do about it. We've seen that in Sri Lanka you know, in relation to the war, post-war, Human Rights Council, everything. So for me, I want to find a way, an answer as to how do we deal with that? Because in Sri Lanka, that's they are, they are one of the bilateral, there are a few bilaterals, which are the ones that have the, the funds or the, the majority of it uh, and funding pretty much everyone through different means, but the money comes back to the same pot in the same capital. Thanks, Ambika. So you've posed a, a question and a challenge for us all um, on this call. What we're hearing, at least, is that there may well be a big difference between the bilaterals, the way in which bilateral donors uh, regard change and, and prioritisation, and those of, of private philanthropic organisations. Um, I would also say that, you know, in our conversations with INGOs, I think they... To a great extent, they do also understand some of the problems and there's a, a willingness or a a, the beginning of a willingness to engage in a transformation process. So, but we are seeing different groups with different interests here. So we're, at, we're going now into the second session um, um, or part two of this conversation. And we're gonna invite you all to put your thinking caps on. Um, so my colleague Jasmine is going to put a link now into uh, the chat. And you will see that now. It's a Jamboard. Um, it's a, a link which takes you to, in effect, a Google document. And there are three questions we're going to ask you. So we, you've got about five to seven minutes, and we might put a little bit of music on if Jasmine um, can find the wonderful Colombian music on our road to Bogota. Um, what we're looking at here is three questions. Each question is on a different slide. So just bear in mind, you'll see one question on one slide. And at the top, you'll see a little arrow where you can then scroll to the next question. There are three questions that we have for you. The first is, what are you hearing and learning about decolonizing in your contexts? And what does that look like in practice? So that's the first question. Any ideas, just put them on there. Hopefully it's fairly straightforward to be able to put your text in there. The second question on the second slide is, what are the blockages and challenges that you see? Now, Ambik has talked about some of those already. Geopolitics, you know, some of those big issues around entrenched interests, um, other things that are you know, dictating the rules of the game. So what are the blockages and challenges? And the third one is, what are you hearing from funders and governments about monetary flows, decolonizing monetary flows? So uh, you don't have to answer all three questions, but just use this as a space to be able to just put any ideas down. And what we're going to do is then reflect on those as a group and, and invite people to, to say a few words as well. And we'll have, we'll have a bit of time. So we now have about five to seven minutes if you want to turn off your cameras, that's fine. If you want to keep them on, that's fine. Um, please put anything down, um, your thoughts, your experiences. We'd love to hear from them now. Thank you. Just a quick note for um, if anyone's new to Jamboard, there's a on the left-hand side, a little square sticky note that you click to add your comments.
folks. I hope you are able to access Jamboard. I think some people might be having a, a little bit of difficulty, but others are, I see a lot of interesting comments already coming up on there. Remember that there are three questions. So see if you can have a look at um, all three if you can, but if not, don't worry. Um, and we'll have another three or four minutes before we before we then invite some input. Okay, folks, um, I hope you had an opportunity to, to feed into the Jamboard and apologies if some of you weren't able to access it, but having a quick look there, we've had some really, really interesting comments. Um, maybe what I'll ask Jasmine and my colleague to do is to share the screen so you can all have a look at that um, as well. And what we'll do now over the next 10, 15 minutes is just um, have a look at some of these comments. And, and just to, to explain what we're going to be doing with this. So we have two sessions. We have this session and we have an afternoon session um, where we're going to be asking the same questions. And from all this information, we are going to then um, sit together uh, with, the, with the Shift the Power team and look at what, how we use this to um, build a conversation at the summit in Bogota. So we may not have answers to some of these questions. Um, but what we do want to do is really um, understand what we can, how we can use this to create a conversation, a really vibrant conversation in Bogota and beyond, by the way. So for those of you who won't be there in Bogota, this is not just about a conversation that is taking place in one moment in time. 
It is about an ongoing conversation um, that we hope to have with um, our friends at Shift the Power and, and, uh, and the wider sector. Um, so um, Amber very um, helpfully has helped um, arrange these into some themes. So what are we hearing? It sounds, it sounds like, at least for slide one, um, that some people are saying that there is no conversation. And I think that's, um, I think that's worrying. I think that shows the state of the, how entrenched power is in the sector. If there are people and um, groups, particularly those in power uh, or who hold power, who are not having any conversation around this, I, I wonder what can be done to, to change that. Um, at Peace Direct, we talk about localization being the sanitized face of change. So where people don't want to talk about shifting power or decolonizing, they talk about localization and they conflate the terms. So maybe what, what we might be hearing is a, a sort of a whitewashing or greenwashing of, of, of uh, change by just calling it localization when actually it needs to be much deeper than that. Um, we there's a second theme that's emerging around power sharing or not people's willingness to share power um or oh, like that power washing um that's that's great um so we're, we're we're hearing that too um and then i guess we're also hearing about people changing practices in the top right hand corner um and a lot around local agency and, and power. And I'm just wondering now, before we move to the uh, other slide, whether um, we should just give an opportunity for anyone to talk about this particular first slide, which is around, you know, what are we hearing and learning? So, you know, you've seen, you know, it's not really, uh, people are saying it's not possible to invoke the word in any conversation because um, we don't know what we're looking for, no discussion on decolonizing, reluctance or even fear. Um, uh, a, a lot of big INGOs talking something, but not much action. Um, a misalignment of understanding. Um, so maybe before we move on to that second slide, could I, uh, I'd like to invite anyone who would like to say something about this. What are they hearing um, and and seeing and what or what themes do they see in this in this group here so you don't have to necessarily speak about your particular uh contribution or note but does anyone want to share any thoughts about what they're hearing and learning about decolonizing in their contexts don't be shy we're all here to to learn from each other would anyone like to um share any thoughts. Sita. Sita, we can't hear you. We have a raised hand, but we're Hi. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Sorry, it took me time to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Great. So I'm from India. So when I say that we don't talk about decolonization, uh, what I actually mean is I think as a country, we've kind of outgrown that word because we've had an independence for over 75 years. But the, a lot of things which are happening is including name change. And you all may have heard it in the news that we're even trying to um, debate about changing the name of the country itself. So that's where we are. But when it comes to, um, you know, the power of decolonization, that's not there much. Uh, and the uh, government and as a country, we're trying to see that we become more self-sustaining. That was the point I tried to make. I don't know whether it's in sync with uh, your overall theme, but uh, I thought I'd just put my ideas there. Thank you. Thanks, Sita. No, I think it absolutely is. I think the, the, the point about uh, autonomy, dignity um, and agency is, is what you just mentioned, you know, trying to be more self-sustaining um, and, and trying to, to, to recognize the power that we all have. So maybe the term maybe isn't that important um, as long as the change agenda is there. 
Um, and uh, so I, I, I hear you. If that's, it's uh, interesting to hear from, from the Indian perspective. Any, anyone else would like to share? Or any comments that uh, they would like to remark on from this first slide? Uh, we have three people. Um, so who is who is next? Um, let's. We've got. I think uh, Kata Mina. Hi. Good day. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, okay. Um, just taking from what Sita was saying, I think in our context, I'm calling from Sierra Leone, by the way. I think in our context. Um, Decolonizing is really not one of the terms you hear that is used in government circles. I think for, in our context, it's something that is mostly used in um, IGO, IG, NGOs. You know, that circle is where you hear the term decolonizing. That doesn't mean that government doesn't work on things like this, but I just think the label is not something they use. They don't, they don't spend their time labeling what they're doing, like how we do, like identifying the language as a um, feminist and progressive organizations and saying, these are the structures that stop people from doing this and that. And this is based somehow to some history of colonization and all of that. So I think in, in our context here, and I work at Purposeful, and we are very power structured, uh, shifting the power and things like that. We name it in, in those terms as opposed to government naming it in those terms. Thank you. Thank you, Kata. And I was about to say, and I'm glad that you are here from Purposeful, which is a wonderful organization. Um, and we are big fans. Um, last night, uh, as I was trying to clean up my room, I was listening to a podcast by, uh, which was interviewing Chernobar, who's obviously your founder, the founder of Purposeful. Um, and he's been a very prominent advocate for um, talking about decolonizing and talking about the, you know, what this actually means in a Sierra Leonean context. Um, and maybe now in his new role, so he's a, he's uh, the founder of Purposeful. For those of you who don't know um, the organisation, but he's now a minister in the government, uh, minister responsible, I think, for civil society. So I think it'll be interesting to see how that conversation then starts to filter into government uh, circles as well. Yeah, we're we're hopeful to know that. That's yes. Um, maybe one final comment then um, from Tim Rees, and then we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks, Dylan. Um, I think you'll know what I'm going to say. You and Jimmy both probably have an idea, but I just, from what I'm picking up today and what I've been picking up with the work that I've been doing with GFCF over the past few weeks um, uh, for uh, in preparation for Bogota, is that you said, Dylan, maybe the word isn't important, but the word is important. I disagree with it wholly. I don't even invoke it or use it anymore because I think it's not appropriate. Uh, to the sector, but I think the word is important because it's just being used so much and it's being used so much without actually understanding what it means and what it means is different things in different contexts. Um, like, like Kata just said, I mean, the government will not use this, neither does our government in Pakistan, uh, but civil society does. And that just shows the difference between government and civil society. They are two completely different entities that should be working together to truly decolonize if you want, but it's they're not working together. And I just had a conversation this morning with Ambika on exactly the same issue, that civil society really doesn't have, it, have its act together in terms of what it wants to do. And this entire discussion about international cooperation takes place in that vacuum where we are disassociating ourselves with a very major entity, which is the government or state um, organizations and entities that actually have the actual power to make decisions about even things like whether civil society is um, able to operate in that country or not. So I think it's really important to um, acknowledge the fact that the wording is important to the extent that it is actually, I think, creating more of a gap between the players who matter as opposed to bringing them closer together. And that every country is at a different space in, uh, in its lifespan right now. And so painting the entire international cooperation sector needing change overall 
doesn't also really apply because some countries may need it more than others. So that's something I think we need to be mindful of when we're having these discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Temriz. A really uh, important contribution there. And I think, you know, I, I think some many of you uh, on this call would agree, um, you know, maybe the words are being misused. Maybe they alienate. Maybe they don't help bring um, bring people together who should be working together. Um, so I think that those are really important contributions, Temriz, and, and thank you for that. You know, um, we would say we agree with that. And we also think that it's important to name problems name problems in, in, in the system that we see and try and find solutions to those. And I think that's the purpose of this co conversation today and this afternoon as well is how can we name those problems? What do we see as those problems? And then how can we then move forward? And that may be um, together with bilateral donors. Sometimes it might be holding them to account uh, and, and really using our voice as civil society as well. And maybe it's a bit of both, um, but thank you. So we're going to move on to the second slide and uh, let's have a look what we have here. So we have a lot of blockages and challenges. That's not a surprise. Um, so what are we seeing here? We're seeing um, strict compliance donor requirements that don't consider the needs of, of, of actors. Um, a lot around that. Um, accountability requirements, fear, loss of um, benefits. Um, geopolitical considerations, Ambika also has already mentioned that, risk of losing funds if, if challenging donors. This is a very interesting case. Um, I uh, have spoken to many um, civil society organisations who are afraid to talk about this because they don't want to lose the small amount of funding that they already receive. So there's a fear of rocking the boat, a fear of, of, of naming the problem, because in naming the problem, you can then find yourself very isolated and find yourself even further excluded from the, the boys club that Ambika talked about, the funding that still is channeled to a small number of organizations. Um, some of you will have heard this statistic uh, before, but 93% of all funding for CSOs in the world goes to Global North CSOs. Only 7% goes directly to civil society organizations in the Global South. We think that's a scandal, but that's the boys club that Ambika is talking about. So imagine losing that funding. Imagine speaking out and then losing that small amount of funding you already have. Um, what else do we see here? We, he we see um, unwillingness of establish established institutions to yield power. Too many INGOs not willing to give up power. Um, preference for localization. So we've talked about that already. Um, and this persistent problem of unequal power dynamics. Um, so I would like to invite anyone to comment on this and to say, you know, what does this, what, what, do, what do they see from this? What are the, you know, I can see an awful lot of problems here and blockages. Um, it seems like there's a lot of institutional inertia. And if, if and that's putting it politely, perhaps we, we might want to say there's resistance. There's resistance to this change. Those in power have have uh, want to maintain power, and maybe there isn't a, a genuine willingness to transform. Um, what do you think, Maiska? Yep. So uh, I had my focus on lack of constructed and stepped plan. So I want to share a bit about what ICA does in our road to Bogota. ICA has just begun its official discussion on decolonizing aid. And we want to maintain, we want to we want to retain uh, the momentum that we have gained uh, during this time. Uh, so what I want I really want to learn from everybody who have had this discussion or who have uh, had done this longer than us, we want to learn how you guys uh, keep the momentum and then really turn this into a solid movement. Thank you. Thanks, Maiska. So there's a, there's a request, how to, how to turn this into a solid movement. Once, once uh, you are aware of the issues, how can you build your allies? We've talked about the, the um, risk that local actors, civil society organizations have in talking about this, naming the problems, how, whatever language you use, naming the problems entails risk. So how can you build your allies across, uh, across the world? 
who can support you, who can ha who can who can um, amplify your messages, and that's maybe something that we need to we need to ask ourselves. Um, are there any other thoughts or questions um, from anyone else? Madonna, is there anything that you see in here, blockages and challenges that that CivSource have experienced? I think I was actually just reflecting on what Mesika had just said um, about how to keep the movement growing. And what came to me was the need to free ourselves from you know, carrying the weight of decolonizing that just because you're championing this conversation in your context does not necessarily mean you have to do it for the long term. Um, you just miss uh, opening the door for others to, you know, introspect, get to learn about this, um, arrive at the Eureka and aha moments, and then they can take on the conversation from there because it's um, a bit of a weight to carry all by yourself. So. In my particular context, I've I've seen um, two of those, some of the people that we talked to that that had earlier referred to take on the conversation in their smaller grassroots organizational movements, and um, the local coalition that's also having similar conversation in our context. So it helps that you know anyone that's looking to have this conversation or navigate decolonizing aid is not looking to you because isn't that what we're trying to dismantle? So um, really diversifying that power in courts, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Madonna. Thank you, uh, Madonna. And um, really interesting what you say there. And I think um, we shouldn't um, underestimate how difficult it is for this conversation to take place in certain places. And you talked about that, you know, it's a difficult responsibility to carry. And maybe part of the conversation we need to have in Bogota is how we can build that sense of collective support and, and solidarity where we are talking about this um, in whichever language we use or, or terms that we use, but how we can create that sense of solidarity um, and support. Um, so let's talk about the final slide and, um, if we can just move that on, I think there you are. Okay, so what are we hearing from funders and governments? Um, so um, similar to slide two, I think, um, regrettably nothing, not much. Um, and if there is a discussion, it seems to be around localization. Um, so I think that there's some interesting um, reality checks for us you know maybe there isn't a, a big enough conversation about this or or the conversation is not taking place in the right places um it's they're almost oblivious to this conversation is one comment um and i have heard this myself and peace director hear, hear this a lot this per perceived tension between the need to be accountable to taxpayers and accountable to communities um as if they're mutually exclusive um, and I think that, that 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 accountability to taxpayers seems to be um, a catch-all excuse for a lot of bilateral donors. Um, and then we have on the left-hand side, we have very we people talking about very performative statements. So we are having those conversations, but really nothing actually happening. Um, but so there's an institutional inertia here, and there's a rhetoric. What I'm seeing and hearing is that there's a lot of rhetoric and, and inertia, but not that move, that movement. Um, so, but I, but I also see some interesting, you know, comments here. Interest, in, increasingly noting internal conversations showing up. So, you know, that might be on localization rather than rather than on decolonizing. Um, so what, what Amber? Looking at this, I mean, you know, the decolonizing wealth project. Um, this is what you do. Now, we, obviously you do that mostly in private philanthropy, but what when you see this, what's your reaction? How have you managed to move past this? You know, we're hearing that there's institutional resistance and inertia. Um, how do we get to a place where that conversation becomes a much more live conversation? Thanks, Dylan, and thanks everyone for all the um, really helpful insights here. I think, you know, we've we've said it to some extent and and just fully want to acknowledge and recognize that context matters and so to the comments that you know this is uh there are this shows up differently in different contexts i just want to 
affirm that, that this is not a one size fits all. Every, every, what works in one place will work in another place. And so um, I just wanna name that, but I think <laughs> there's a couple different dynamics. So one is um, to your point around creating a movement. I think it does actually put a lot of pressure uh, folks in philanthropy often are um, subject to the fresh outside pressure in some cases. We saw this uh, in the U.S. a couple of years ago during um, a period of, you know, kind of racial reckoning here in the United States. And we saw a number of donors and philanthropy stepping forward and naming their part in uh, perpetuating racial inequities and putting forward pledges to uh, redistribute wealth. And that happened largely as a result of uh, broad scale naming of this issue and social pressure. So once a kind of critical mass of, of folks with wealth started putting forward these pledges, we started to see a landslide. Now the key is in the follow through, but I think that, and where we have not seen it as, um, as widespread as we would like, but I think the what it points to is that social pressure is a real thing. And that, you know, when we organize, when we have consistent messaging, when we, when we push philanthropy in that way, that we can actually start to change narratives and put pressure for uh, on folks who have access to this wealth and power to change their practices in in pretty transformative ways. Thanks, Amber. Well, that's a good pep talk for us all. Um, it sounds like you know, and what we hear and what we see from your work in the U.S. and this you know happened quite a few years ago. You named the issue you built a critical mass of people who are agitating for that issue. And by naming the issue and being public about that, other people felt that they had to make a commitment. They made a commitment, but as you said, the follow on was the most important thing. And holding them to those commitments has been, you know, the challenge, but that actually you are starting to see change. So pressure does work. Folks on this call, pressure does work. Naming the problem does work, but it isn't just about the problem. It's also about the solution. And I think that's really important in terms of whether you talk about decolonizing philanthropy or decolonizing international cooperation. It's one thing to show the dysfunctions in the system. It's another thing to actually point to the system and the world that we want. And I think that's why the road to Bogota is so important and the Shift the Power Summit is so important because we have to be able to articulate the kind of world that we're looking to, 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 to forge together, um, whether we're civil society organizations, foundations, governments, think tanks, policy makers. And I think it's, we can take inspiration from what the Decolonizing Wealth Project has been doing. Um, with the small amount of time that we have left, I just want to then move on now to what's next. So as I mentioned to you uh, at the beginning, we're going to use this information to try and figure out what conversations we should be having. And obviously we have started to see some themes emerging in terms of institutional stuckness and uh, resistance, the need for there to be a critical mass, how to build a movement, how to name those dysfunctions in the system whilst also protecting those um, and the burden that it, it is sometimes to carry the weight of talking about some of this. So, so in the last few minutes before I hand over to Jenny, I just wanted to invite any of the speakers um, to, to share, or anyone else on this call, um, what are the conversations that you think that we should be having in, in Bogota about this? Is it how to build a movement? Is it how to, how to build allies across um, the, 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 the different sectors? Is it about how, how do we take a lesson from the Decolonizing Wealth Project and name it? How do we name it more? How do we articulate the problems uh, to those who aren't listening? Um, so, any any thoughts from any of the speakers today? Ambika, what do you think? What do what do you think is the one conversation that we should be focusing on? If you had to choose one one conversation that you'd want to see in Bogota, what would it be around this topic? Hmm, uh, I think allies is is very important, and as was I think you said it earlier, Dylan. Uh, sometimes naming it also means reprisal. So it is uh, 
for the trust. I think we are more privileged in our context. So we can name it and still not face reprisals because we're not dependent on these entities. Uh, but for others, there would be. So how do we create that space to allow them to name it and also for pushback? Because we do need to have that safety net. If not, we can't just tell them name it and they have to face the repercussions. So that is one. The other is how do we um, also build allies? And because sometimes, uh, practically speaking, we might find that uh, a global entity that has offices all over the world in a particular country, let's say in Sri Lanka, they might not be particularly progressive, but perhaps headquarters is. So how do we push the envelope here is by uh, connecting with someone there. And for that, we need to know someone who knows someone and those connections, the networks. So we build allies through that, perhaps globally to put pressure locally. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambika. Um, I'm going to ask the same question of the other speakers. So, um, Meska, what is the one conversation that you would like to see take place? We've heard from um, Ambika how to build allies, mm -hmm. how to how to name the issue and anticipate the pushback, and how to yeah. how to understand where you can advance this conversation in country and in other spaces. What about you, Meska? What do you think? Uh, I think aside from how to we can build ally and then build a stronger movement because uh the the discussion regarding the colonizing aid i think it, it's not a new uh, thing in indonesia it just has taken a form in another name but not explicitly the colonizing aid but it's been a, a revolving conversation uh and then i think we didn't really see any organization starting this conversation and then uh, we think that it's really interesting because when we gather uh, representatives of other organizations, they also mentioned that this is something that is concerning for them, but they just weren't sure how to do about it. And then when they learned that, oh, there are other organizations as well in Indonesia, in national level, who share this concern, they see that this is an important um, uh, an important opportunity to to bring this conversation into a larger um, scale. And then I think another topic that we need to discuss is how we can celebrate local resources. Uh, and there were several um, CSOs forum, and then these forums, they would uh, talk about resource mobilization. But uh, what what concerning for us, especially for ECA, is that when, when they mention resource that uh, the eyes were only set on on funds, and I think this increased the dependency on external funding. When we see other grassroots organizations who they 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 still need funds, but they they don't turn it into the center of how to operate their the organization. They they can mobilize the the volunteerism of the people. Uh, they can. Uh, they can harness the, the local wisdom, the local knowledge, uh, and really acknowledge it as, as an important um, resource so they can be uh, self-sufficient. I think uh, those two things are what important for the next uh, conversations. Thank you, Maiska. Um, that, that's that's great to hear. And I, we've made notes of that. Um, I'm, we've almost run out of time. I want to just note the two uh, suggestions that we have. One from Nicolee, naming and understanding the movement, defining um, the context and build allies um, that act in unanimity um, without backlash from within. And also the radical from Olam, the radical redis redistribution of power resources. How do we dismantle institutional philanthropy? Um, before I hand over to to Jenny, um, Madonna, what any any last thoughts, and also Amber, and then just you know if we can try and wrap up in the next uh, minutes, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, so yes, any any ideas of what you would like to see at at Bogota? So um, I'd like to see um, how the conversation transitions from yeah a conversation to some action, uh, because there's already a hunger for what's next. 
tangibly other than pushback. And from the conversations that we've posted, there have been a couple of dissenting voices that are surfacing and you know already stating that they're waiting for this wave to end because civil society generally tends to have the reputation to say the most and do the least. So I think it would be one way to kill a movement if we keep it as a conversation without some action. So I'm looking to see um, a transition from the rhetoric to action. So there you are. I'll just plus one that, Madonna. Thank you. How do we how do we organize and provide support and cover uh, to be able to move the movement forward? Um, thank you, uh, Madonna and Amber. So there you are. That's a challenge for us all. Let's let's make sure that this converts from a conversation to some action. Um, Jenny, over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Technology. Um, thanks, everyone. Really um, great inputs into the conversation. We're running this similar version of it, round two at 4 p.m. UTC today, where we'll have colleagues from Comwa, the Social Justice Philanthropy Network in Brazil, from Adesso, who's done a lot of work, um, Degan Ali, its leader, done a lot of work on decolonization um, and Liberation Africa, um, Liberation Alliance Africa, uh, colleagues in West Africa. So if you want round two, it's going to be a continuation, a building of, and um, I think this was just a really important way to start thinking about how do we go about this in ways that are meaningful and actually move things forward with all the attention to nuance and context that I think many of you mentioned. But thank you everyone for joining. Um, and those of you who will be in Bogota, we look forward to seeing you there. Those of you who aren't, you'll be with us in spirit and you're with us anyway, because the work will continue. Thank you everybody. Thank you, folks. It's been lovely to have you all here and uh, look forward to continuing not only the conversation, but the action.